Proximity is powerful. Proximity is powerful. You know this to be true in, in many areas of your life. Right? Have you ever tried to like FaceTime a loved one? How well does that go? You got kids, let me just tell you right now. If you have kids trying to FaceTime relatives, you, you heard the laughs. It's chaos. Right? Like my in-laws live 12 and a half hours away in Georgia, and when we try to FaceTime them, nobody enjoys the experience. <laughs> my in-laws have on record said it's miserable. My kids don't enjoy it. But yet we get close to them in proximity, face to face. Our kids cannot get enough of their grandparents. The grandparents can't get enough of their grandkids. Right? We have this thing even with social media where things that are really far away we, we get a peek into and, and we get some connection, but in reality it's, it's far away. And that does something to your soul, right? Where you get an insight into something close, but really you're at a distance. But there, there's a sculpture in Foundry Park right down the street here that's made out of all these recycled bicycle parts. And it looks like chaos. It's just like this weird looking sculpture. And then you get close to it. You get near it and it's, it's a cat. Sophie the cat. And our kids, I remember we went to the park and uh, we were like, what in the world is this sculpture? And we get close and we're like, oh my gosh, it's this massive cat. You would not know. This is jumbled parts. Until you get close, you get proximity, and you realize, oh, it's something unique. It's something beautiful. It's something spectacular to look at. Proximity has power. This morning, I want us to, to look at that reality of, of the fact that Christmas is all about proximity. The Christmas narrative, the Christmas story, the whole hope of the season, the good news of great joy, is that not just that proximity is powerful, but that proximity is possible. Proximity is closer than you might even realize. One of my favorite quotes, like of all time, is by a guy named C.S. Lewis, and he says this. He's got a lot of great ones, but here, here's one of my favorites. It's really the summary of the Christmas season. The Son of God became a man, so that men could become sons of God. That's Christmas in a sentence. And so this morning, if we are going to look at our main takeaway, I kind of rephrased a little bit of C.S. Lewis's quote to kind of give us our main takeaway this morning, and it's this. The good news of great joy is that God comes close to humanity so that humanity can come close to God. I want you to know, I, I often, every time I, I preach, I want to give you a, what I call sermon in a sentence. Here it is, right here. That's it. This one, I had to recraft time and time again. I had to change and tweak the language and the words. And at first, I had it saying that God came close to humanity. It's not accurate. It's true in the sense that he did come close, but he's coming close to you today. And so I want you to, to think about what, what this statement is saying, is that God comes close. He's coming close to you and me today. Why? So that you and I can come close to him. This isn't just something that happened. So we were praying back there. I, I think Nate was praying that we wouldn't just see that the Christmas story is <coughs> history. It's present narrative. That the same God is pursuing us today, coming close to us, that we would come close to him. Christmas is all about Proximity. Let's dive into the text and see it for ourselves. Verse 1 of chapter 2 in the book of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Let's pause for just a moment. Why are they being registered? It's actually important for us to know. Taxes. Taxes is why they were being registered. It sounds fun. It sounds glamorous, right? Taxes. It's important for you to know that. We'll get back to it in a moment. But that's the primary reason that registrations would happen would be for tax purposes. Often military reasons as well. The, man, the government wanted their money. So, so that's what they're trying to do. Get, get everybody together, figure out what's going on, where's everybody at, for tax purposes. Verse 2, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to where? Judah, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. If we know our Old Testament, that's important, it's significant, that the birth of Jesus is going to come through the line of David. God makes a promise, and as Darren so beautifully said last week, when God makes a promise, it's as good as God. And so God makes a promise here, a long time ago, that man, the Son of God is going to come through the lineage of David, and boom, we see this set up right here. It's going down right here in the text that Joseph happens to, just so happens to be in the line of David. It's a big deal and it's much needed information because the Messiah is the one who would come through the line of David and rule on David's throne forever. Verse 5. Or actually, one more fun fact. Bethlehem, you know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. How fitting for the bread of life to be born in Bethlehem. 
Verse 5, to be registered with Mary. Listen to this phrase, his betrothed who was with child. That is a wild sentence. You shouldn't read it as if it's normal. If we know the narrative, right, we, we've talked about it in this series. How did Mary get pregnant? She's a virgin, still a virgin, and she's with child. She's betrothed. You want to talk about the scandalousness of the Christmas narrative? And how odd this would have looked to the world? Right, again, that, that she's never had intercourse, and she's with child, and she's betrothed. That would have been all kinds of awkward in the culture. And yet here we see, in the middle of the birth of our king, the birth of our savior, the one who is worthy of adoration and praise, we see this weird sentence that says that he was registering with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. That's odd. And yet it's so beautiful. And a part of the narrative, the miracle of what we're caught up in. Verse 6. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. So again, Jesus must be born in Bethlehem. He must be born where David's lineage comes from to fulfill the messianic prophecies. And Mary's around nine months pregnant, and so if you're, you're, you're kind of following the narrative, you know Mary's nine months pregnant, and she's not in Nazareth, that causes some big problems for those who want to follow the messianic prophecies, right? How is she going to get there? How is she going to get there? Well, how does God get Mary to Bethlehem? Taxes. Taxes. That, that's how the God, the sovereign God of the universe, gets Mary in the position to give birth to our King Jesus taxes. So this point is just for free. It's a little silent for you, but it's this. God uses all things for his purposes and his plans. All things. And may I add the annoying, seemingly insignificant things. You know how annoying taxes are? Can we be honest in church? Taxes are annoying. And yet God in his goodness and his sovereignty and his love and his grace and his mercy even uses taxes to orchestrate all of his plans, including the birth of our king. So again, this isn't even a main point for you. But I'm just letting you know, if you're caught up in some of the annoying, seemingly insignificant things in your life, you know, if God can use taxes to give birth to the king, what can he do in your life? With the annoying, seemingly insignificant things. Part of being a part of the kingdom of God is that anything annoying and seemingly insignificant is just a setup to be used by the king. But you see your life through these lenses. Verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Because there was no place for them in the end. Alright, first major point for us this morning. God comes close to humanity in humility. God comes close to humanity in humility. I want us to highlight this morning the simple reality that God became a human. Like if that's somehow seemingly mundane or insignificant, you don't get it. God became human. This is the ultimate form of humility. You realize the God of the universe who spoke things to existence, spins planets around on his finger like a basketball, thought of the idea of creating humanity, submitted to becoming a human from conception unto death. I heard a preacher say this week that, so, so Jesus who forms us in the womb was in the womb forming John in the womb. Think about it, like, three-month-old Jesus in the womb is creating John at full term in the womb. In the womb that he already created. Like, he created Mary's womb, and he's creating himself while he's creating John. As a three-month-old embryo, baby. Like, that's the power of our God. That's what he did. That's the type of humility that our king is about. That he became human, and he submitted to the entire process of being human. He didn't just pop out at 12 years old. But he started from the womb all the way to 33 years and died on the cross. And everything in between, all of the life's ups and downs, Jesus submitted to. Look at the narrative. He was born into an average family. You know what was extraordinary about Mary and Joseph? Not much. They were in the line of David, but they were average, lower, middle class folks. Mary was a, a humble teenage girl, probably somewhere around the ages of 13 to 15. Joseph, a carpenter, who swung a hammer. He's probably fit, but just your average carpenter. And that's the family that the God of the universe was born into. He was born in a pretty odd fashion. There was this consensus with taxes and tons of people, and so there wasn't room for him. And so he was born in a pretty odd fashion. 
then he was wrapped in swaddling clothes like other normal human babies were. <laughs> like we read that, and like, oh, what's the significance of the swaddling clothes? Nothing. That's it. That's the beauty, is that he was a normal baby, so it seemed. Being wrapped in swaddling clothes, the naked, exposed baby Jesus was wrapped in clothes so he wouldn't get cold like any other baby would have been. And yet, don't miss the significance of this extraordinary moment. Jackie Hill Perry, who's a pretty well-known Christian influencer, she speaks and, and writes and does music, and I feel like everything she touches turns to gold. She's just really great. She, she has this quote about the idea of Jesus coming close and being wrapped in swaddling clothes. Listen. Moses couldn't come near the bush. Isaiah could see God's robe filling the temple, but he could not see his face. Israel could not come near the mountain. Uzzah simply placed his hand on the ark, and God's wrath came out in judgment, which killed him. The priests could only go into God's presence once a year, and even then, there was a constant threat of death. What we see from Genesis to Malachi is the story of people not being able to freely come near to God because of his holiness and their sin. But the glory of the incarnation is that God himself has come near to us. For Jesus to be swaddled, God had to be touched. For the shepherds to praise God, for that the Savior was born, God had to be seen. The holy, holy, holy God that Isaiah saw on the throne condescended, taking on human flesh, living with, eating with, speaking with, and touching sinners. This is why he is called Emmanuel, God with us. And she says, please don't miss the mercy in this, that God the Son has come near so that we might have direct access to God the Father. What's so beautiful about the average looking scenario is that God comes close. The fact that Jesus was swallowed means that God was held. The same God who could not be approached in the Old Testament. Why? Because he is holy and we are not. In humility was born into humanity so he could be touched. He could be heard, he could be seen, he could become close to who? Sinners. I don't care how you feel this morning, you are not too far. You're not too dirty. You're not too jacked up. That's who God goes after, man. You feel broken, you feel busted, you feel jacked up, like that, God's coming to you. Would you receive him this morning? Yeah. He was laid to rest in a feeding trough for animals. I'm talking the king of kings. Not, not just a king, the king of kings. The kings bowed to this dude. And he was laid in a feeding trough where animals ate. Why? Humility. You realize God could have done this any way he wanted to? Why? He's God. Yeah. And in his perfect place, manger, feeding trough, I like it. Let's go with it. I don't have a plan B because this plan A is really good. Humility. Not to mention his birth was an act of humility of his entire life. And Jesus sought after the low, the outcast, the far off, the sinner, to the point where he got accused of being those things. And he went after them. He lived a total life of humility. He models humility for us. Philippians tells us that God did, or Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Therefore, he humbled himself. God said, I, I'm not going to count being God a thing to be grasped. Therefore, I'm going to humble myself. Jesus embodies humility to the T. And what Jesus shows us is that the true way to life is that if you want to get up, you have to go down. If you want to be elevated and exalted and lifted high, you have to go down. The Bible tells us that God opposes the proud, but that he gives grace. He lavishes grace to the humble. And the gracious thing about our God is that, yes, he can and will humble you, but he gives you a chance to humble yourself. So this morning, as we look at the birth narrative of Jesus and even his life and the way he died and the way he rose again in victory, like we look at the humility modeled in our King Jesus. The call for us this morning is to approach him with that same type of humility. To look at him. And move towards him in that type of humility. Because here's the cool thing about Jesus. He comes close to us in humility, not just to make it possible for us to get close to God, but to show us how to get close to God. 
So Jesus being humble not only gets us closer to God, it shows us the way. Here at Zeal Church, if you hang out long enough with us, you're going to see our core values plastered on this wall and hopefully written on our hearts and modeled through our hands and feet. And one of them back there in the back there, you see humility, being humble. Humility is our position. That's not just a cute little thing we decided to plaster on the wall. It's the way of King Jesus. It's not just the way of Christmas. It's the way of the Christian life. If you want to follow Jesus, humility has to be your position. Why? Because it's his. You will not exceed him. And so if he goes down, you must go down too. But he promises that the way up is actually down. And here's what I know to be true. Humility is what leads to intimacy with God. Talk to anybody in the room who has a relationship with God where they feel close, where they feel intimate, where they feel like they hear him and, and see him move and they feel connected and they feel like life is sprouting. Humility will be at the foundation of that. Like, like, think of anybody in the room, you're like, man, I want to be like that. Humility will be at the core. If it's not, don't follow. If humility's not in, in my core, don't follow me. Jesus tells us that humility, he shows it, he models us. He withdraws to be with the Father and to have some intimacy, to be dependent and connected to his Father, the, the perfect model of intimacy and humility. If you want intimacy with God, if you want to feel connected, if you want to feel close, if you want to feel alive, if you want to have impact for the kingdom, if you want all those things that the Christian life offers, way up is down. Way up is down. God comes close to us in humility. So let us come close to him this morning in humility too. Verse 8. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field. Now check this out. So the birth of Jesus just went down. Like the, the greatest miracle of all time. Well, wait a minute, Alex, the resurrection. Yes, right up there, Birth doesn't happen, resurrection doesn't happen. Right? So one of the greatest miracles of all time just happened. The birth of King Jesus. And then what's going down in the fields. And then the same region there were shepherds out in the field. We, we kind of have a tendency even in the Christian life to like look at shepherds uh, probably more highly than anybody else would have. We really like shepherds. So the fact that the narrative turns from the king of the universe to shepherds, we'll talk about some humility. Like the highest of the high to now the lowest of the low. That's where we just transition to one verse. So they're out in the fields and they're keeping watch over the flock by night. So again, we wouldn't ask this question, but we need to. Why, why shepherds? Why are the shepherds caught up in the story? One commentator says this, why shepherds? Why not to priests or scribes? By visiting the shepherds, the angel revealed the grace of God towards mankind. Shepherds were really outcasts in Israel. Their work not only made them ceremonially unclean, but it kept them away from the temple for weeks at a time so that they could not be made clean. So God does not call the rich and mighty, he calls the poor and the lowly. Why does God choose to send an angel to reveal this good news that we're about to talk about to shepherds? Because he's revealing his true heart of humility. And I'm not just coming after those who are high and mighty, those who are elevated and, and up there. I'm coming for those who are forgotten about, the downcast, the lowly, the unclean. That's why it goes to the shepherds. Verse 9, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were feel, filled with great fear. This is like the third or fourth time in this narrative that we've been in in Luke, where we see angels show up and then fear happens. <laughs> we watched a video a while ago where the video actually narrates it saying they were freaked out. They were scared. They, were, they didn't know what to do. Why? Because an angel showed up on the scene. And so, again, we need to see. That's the normal response when God shows up. Like, we should have some level of fear. But, but what does the angel do? He speaks right into that. And the angel said to him, or said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Let's break this down for just a little bit. When God recognizes that you and I have fear, what does he do? He speaks to it. He speaks to her. Do, do you feel afraid? Have you ever felt afraid in your life? God knows and God speaks to it. What does he say? He says, fear not. He's addressing it. Hey, I know you're afraid. I know who I am. I know who my angels are. I know what they're about. I know how terrifying this looks. Don't be afraid. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling fearful in your life, you're feeling anxious, one, God knows, two, he's going to speak to it. Would you let him? Would you, like, be quiet long enough? To let him say to you, do not be afraid. 
Because God's presence, when it shows up, will speak to fear. Perfect love, a.k.a. God's presence, casts out what? Fear. Do you let him speak to your fear? The angel not only says, don't be afraid, but he tells you why you shouldn't be afraid. He's, he's got three things. He's got good news, a great joy, that will be for all people. Let's break it down. Good news. That's what the word gospel means. It's good news. In a world full of bad news, in a world that's desperately in dire need for hope, in a world that hasn't heard prophetically from God in 400 years, this is good news. The angel showing up would have been dramatic and amazing and, and beautiful, but it, it's, bring, it's bringing good news of what? Great joy. Not little joy, not some joy, great joy. And again, we've talked about this idea of joy. Joy, it, it translates, it equates to happiness in God. And so, so it's joy that, that actually is rooted in something bigger than just fickle feelings or, or once a year traditions or making sure you get the right Christmas family photo where your kid's not picking their nose. Like it's rooted in something bigger than just how you feel. Like it's good news of great joy that is rooted in a greater reality that will surpass all things and will last for all eternity. Good news of great joy. For who? Don't miss this. All people. Again, it comes through the line of Israel, comes through the Jews, for all people. And so right here we see again the heartbeat of God that's throughout the entire Old Testament, kind of coming off the pages here in the reality that and this Jesus, who's come to bring good news and great joy, is for everyone. It's for everyone. Did you hear me? It's for everyone. So if you're sitting in a seat this morning, it's for you. Ah, oh, but it's for them Christian folks. No, it's for you. It's for those who feel far away from God. It's, it's for those who've run away from God. It's for those who, who actually want nothing to do with it. It's still for you. I think it's bogus. God didn't ask your opinion. It's for you, though. Good news this morning is for all of us. That's the beauty, that's the, the scandal of grace, if you will, of Christmas, that God has come to bring good news of great joy for all people. Would you receive it? So what is this good news of great joy that's for everyone? We know that that's what it is, but, but what is the news? Verse 11 tells us. Don't miss this. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is the good news. Mm -hmm. That blow your mind? But how often do we want to do Jesus and? How often do we want to make Jesus but? You get these other things too? No, it's just Jesus. That's the only good news here. It's just Jesus. It's a person who's come close and he, he's coming to get intimate and real and to get into the raw and the thick. It's Jesus. It's not Jesus and. It's not Jesus plus. It's not Jesus and then maybe something else someday. It's Jesus. And why I think God's doing big things in this community and why God is on the move, because we get it. We, it's all about him. It's nothing else. Jesus doesn't owe us anything else. It's just him. And that is enough. I'm here to tell you this morning it's enough. Jesus is enough. Just him. With nothing else is enough. But make sure you understand who Jesus is. What does the text tell us? He's a Savior. Who is Christ the Lord. From infancy, the angels are proclaiming. It's not our opinion. It's God's opinion. It's God's heart saying, He's Savior and Lord. He can't be one or the other. And then, just if, if you look at the trends of the world, like even now in America, to some extent, G, we were talking, I was talking about this with somebody last night. Like, Jesus being Savior is somewhat popular still in our country. Being Lord, not so much. And yet the offer of this table this morning for us at Christmas is that Jesus is coming close, but he's coming close as Savior and Lord. If he saves you, he must be Lord or he didn't save you. Like, you, don't, you, you have to get the full package because that's what Jesus is offering to you this morning. And if you're here this morning and you've only received Jesus as Savior, I have good news for you this morning. He's your Lord. And here's, here's really great news. He's better at ruling your life than you are. You want to know why you're miserable? It's because you're only seeing him halfway. He can save you from your sins, but he can change your life too. He can help you not walk in sin anymore. He can help you walk in righteousness and holiness. He can give you peace and joy and life and life to the full. He can give you courage beyond your wildest dreams. But you must submit to him as both Savior and Lord. Why? Because that's the only offer on the table. 
And I love you enough this morning to, to tell you that. That the offer of Christmas is Jesus, but it's Him as both. Do you see Jesus as both Savior and your Lord? And if the answer to that is yes, do you treat Him as such? Part of your maturity and growth as a disciple of Jesus is your opinion matters less in your life and His opinion matters more. The freedom of following Jesus is your opinion doesn't matter. And here's the, here's the thing. How many times has your opinion led you astray? You can't count that. How many times has your feelings and your thoughts and your wants and your, blah, 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 your will, your desire, how many times has that led you astray? You can't count that. And so the beauty of Jesus being the Lord is you can let go of what you think and embrace what he thinks. I'm not saying it's always going to be easy. I'm just saying he knows best. And part of following Jesus is that type of freedom where the burden of your opinion can die. And you can rise in the lightness of his opinion. Verse 12 says, And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is, with whom he is pleased. Second point, God comes close to humanity to provide peace. To provide peace. Yo, what a scene this is. Like, an angel's coming, which, again, in this narrative, that's the third time that's happened, but then the angel is joined with a multitude of heavenly hosts. What does that even mean? Like, just all kinds of angelic beings, all kinds of heavenly hosts just coming down and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. What an amazing scene that they would have been caught up in in this moment. But what are the angels in the heavenly hosts proclaiming? God's glory in our peace. God's glory in our peace. What does peace mean? The word is shalom. It translates well-being, health, prosperity, security, soundness, and completeness. It's like holistic peace. It's like everything that was wrong is now being made right. That, that's the like, It's better than you think it is. Like if you think you have a grasp on what shalom is, it's bigger. And that's what Jesus has come to provide. That's why he got close to humanity, was to provide you a holistic peace. Peace in areas you didn't know you needed peace. Not just like freedom from anxiety, but holistic living, completeness, fullness, everything back to Garden of Eden type, and even better. Because grace makes it better than the garden. That, that's what God is trying to provide for you and for me in the person of Jesus. And so how does God do it? Well, he doesn't just attack the symptoms. He attacks the root. He doesn't, here he says, he doesn't just attack the symptoms. He attacks the roots. What does he do? He sends Jesus to be born. Why? So he could die. Isn't this weird? That Christmas, the birth of our Savior, that we have to, we have to, have to highlight he was born to die. He was born to live a life of perfection, but to die for our sins. Why? Because Jesus tackles the root issue, which is what? We don't have peace with God. That's the root issue. You want to know why everything's broken and, and busted and missing and, and not as good as we want it to be? Why are our expectations constantly plummeting? Why? Because there's no peace between God and man. And from Genesis 3, that was the mission that God was on, to get peace with God and man back together again. So that it can deal with the peace between humanity itself, but it's got to be tackling the root issue. And so Jesus doesn't just come to tackle your symptoms, people. He comes to attack the root issue. And the root issue is that apart from Jesus Christ, we are dead in our sins. The Bible says we're children of wrath. And so if you're here this morning, I love you enough to tell you, if you do not know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you are dead in your sin. You are a child of wrath. And I gladly tell you that this morning because the good news is that Jesus came so you don't have to be anymore. Jesus came to give you life, to, to take you from being a child of wrath to a son or a daughter of the Most High God. That's the good news of Christmas, is that Jesus came to make peace between us and God. So how does he do it? Well, Jesus lives a perfect life. Because he's the God-man, because he's born of the Holy Spirit. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit. He has the capacity to live a life of perfection, sinless, for 33 straight years, perfection. Like, you can't even fathom what that looks like, but it's true. 
That's important because he's set up in his perfection to then be a sufficient sacrifice for our sin. What does that mean? Because it means that Jesus not only was willing to die for you, but his death would actually work. It's one thing for Jesus to be willing to die for you. That's noble. It's another thing for his death to actually do something. The good news of the gospel of Jesus is not just that Jesus was willing to. Oh, yes, he was. But his death actually worked. His death took care of the sin problem. It paid all of the price that your sin had accrued. Jesus died in your place as you. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. He came close to give us peace by dealing with our sin. And it's great that he died for our sins. And that was why he lived his life. His mission was to be obedient to the Father, to live, to die. But the story ends if he doesn't rise again. In the gospel is good news because his death worked because his resurrection proves it did. When he rose again in victory, we're, we're worshiping an alive Jesus this morning, church. It's not some fairy tale off in the distance of a God who did something then and still in the grave. He's alive and well. We don't wait till Easter. That's silly. He's alive today and well and ruling and reigning and worthy of praise as much if not just, just as much as he is on Easter. And so that Jesus rose again in victory signifying that his Peace, the peace between us and God is actually there. It's possible. And he sent his spirit. When he, he uh, ascended to be with his Father, he then sent the spirit of God so that we could be empowered to receive the gift of grace and to walk in the fullness of life that the spirit has for us and to empower us and make us more like Jesus. And that's how we get peace with one another. It's the spirit of God. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, man, peace ain't possible. Just chaos and crazy. Yeah, because even with him, we can be knuckleheads, amen? <laughs> and so the beauty of the Spirit of God now is that because peace between God and man is possible, peace between us is possible. And when you're right with God, some of the petty problems you have with other people just fade away. And the things that aren't petty can actually be tackled head on because that's what Jesus does with brokenness. He tackles it head on. And so we have the model, the humble model of Jesus himself. So Jesus makes peace between us and each other, so we can live in peace and unity with one another. Like it's not a fairy tale, it's not some facade that, that is out there for us to have one day, it's possible now. And here's the beauty, Zeal, we're in it. You're, you're living it. I'm so proud of you as your pastor. I could just rant for days. It's not the point of this message, but I just want to tell you, man, like we're, we did this as a church. And we're living at peace with one another because we have peace with God. You know, we're loving each other well. We're serving each other. We're sacrificing for one another. And there's so much more that we're not even tapped into yet, but, but we're tapping into some. And it's beautiful. And that's a testament to the fact that the peace between us and God is there and that we're having peace with one another. Isaiah 9, verse 7 tells us that the, the increase of God's government and his peace will be forever. So Jesus doesn't just come close to give us peace that's temporal, it's eternal. It's not just eternal, it's, it's getting better over time. In other words, the peace of Jesus today is better than it was 10 years ago. The peace of Jesus today is not as good as it will be in 10 years from now. Because the increase of his government's peace is going on forever. And what good news we have in Jesus. Verse 14 tells us that God is getting the glory through Jesus. And because God is getting all the glory, glory in the highest, that's what leads to the peace on earth. So here's just a little side point. If, if you want to experience the tangible peace in your life more, give glory to God. Something we're like vigilant here, like we don't have time to focus on ourselves because God's too good. Like I'm for real. Like we want to be a church that just magnifies Jesus. It doesn't mean we don't like deal with our stuff in our lives. But how we deal with our stuff is getting up. Looking at gl the glory of God in the highest and letting the weight of that bear on us to the point that it overwhelms us and it breaks off some of the mess that we have and some of the pettiness and some of the, even the hard things because the weight of the glory of God is more significant than whatever you're going through. He's so good. God got into the nitty gritty of the human life and he did so to provide peace for you and for me. And he's doing the same this day. So would you receive this morning? Zeal. What do you do with the offer of Jesus coming close to provide peace? You receive it. You receive it. And you rest in it. Verse 15, when the angels went away 
from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So verse 16 says, And they went with haste. If you take notes, circle, highlight, underline that forward phrase, they went with haste. And found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up in all, all these things, honoring them in her heart. This man, Mary knew. But Mary, did you know? Yes. <laughs> Proof right there. Listen to verse 20. This is, this is very significant. And the shepherds returned. They returned. Glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told. Third and final point. God comes close to humanity for people to proclaim. God comes close to humanity in humility to provide peace, supernatural peace, so that we can be people who proclaim. You see the pattern. You see the build. Jesus, in all of his glory, humbles himself to come near to provide a peace that only God can bring so that we don't just sit on our tails and coast into eternity, but that we actually live to be people who proclaim the good news of what we've encountered. Verse 15 and 16, it says this phrase, they went with haste. Again, imagine, if you will, if we even can, what it would have been like to be those shepherds. The seemingly lowly, outcast, stinky ones of society. And the angels and all of God's glory comes and meets them in their field. Doesn't say, hey, get out of your field and come encounter me. No, he goes to them in their mess, if you will, and, and reveals his glory to them. What would that have even been like? I want to talk about becoming undone. These shepherds being like, my goodness, for 400 years we've been longing to hear from God, and now he's here. And it's beyond our expectations, and it's wilder than we ever thought, and it's so good, and I can't get enough. And then it tells us in the text that the angels dipped. They went back. And so, so what do they do? Well, they said, we, we have to tell somebody what we just experienced. Like they were caught in something so marvelous, something so beautiful, something so magnificent that they didn't just go back to shepherding. Serious. They, they went and told everybody they could, and so they left with haste. They left with haste. They had an encounter with the living God. The angel said, you'll find him. Go get him. Go after him. And so they left with haste. They didn't hesitate. They didn't contemplate. They didn't come up with a game plan. They didn't have a strategy. I'm not saying these are bad. In fact, those are great things. We need strategies and plans. So when God tells us to do something, we need to do it. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And it's one thing to calculate and be wise and, and full of knowledge. It's another thing to be like doubtful and distant and, and to drag our feet. And so what we see the shepherds model for us beautifully is that part of the proclamation means we go when we're supposed to go. We don't hesitate when God tells us to do something. It was clear as day what they were supposed to do and they went with pace. Would we notice that and make Note of it. That's part of our command. That's part of our call. So we're called to go. Uh, Jesus in, in the Great Commission says, hey, sit around and do you know some contemplation, and then when you feel ready and you feel equipped, go and make disciples. Is that what he says? No. He says, go. In fact, as you're going and doing life, is how it's really translated, make disciples. So you come up with plans and strategies, it's great, but go. Like part of making disciples is falling on your face. It's, it's messy. It's making, making mistakes. It's like, oh, crap, I should have done that. Let me do it this way. That's part of discipleship. It's beautiful. But it's not being hasty. Or it is. It's going with haste. It's not being reluctant or hesitant. Verse 17, and they made known what they were told. They didn't try to, like, conjure up something else. They didn't try to add to the story. They didn't remove some of the awkward details. Hey, yeah, uh, we were shepherding some sheep, and it got kind of crazy, like, are you really going to believe that angels and then other angels showed up? They didn't really care what other people thought. They just regurgitated what they had seen and what they were told to say. So again, part of what it means for us to proclaim is that we don't add or take away. Man, in a world, in a context, in a culture where what we try to do is doctor up the Bible, ooh, that's offensive. Let's remove that. No, we don't like sin or repentance. Those are awkward words. Remove those. Now let's hyper-focus on something that's true at the expense of the other truths. Or, or, man, like, I don't know, that was cool, but I think we can make it cooler by adding this. They just, they just said what they were told. They're like, ah, 
don't shoot the messenger, just, this is what happened. That's faithfulness. That's what it means to proclaim. So I just want to encourage whoever's in the room who's like, I, I get inside my own head, or I feel anxious, or I, I feel fearful. for, what am I supposed to do? Just go and tell what you know. Like, don't veer from this book. Just open it and read it. Like, you can't go wrong with it. And if God's given you the ability to articulate this thing well, great. But if you don't know how to do that, just start here. And get around people who do and will help and coach you in that. But they just, they went and told what they knew. They made known what they knew, which was that, man, the good news of great joy for all people has come. Jesus, the Savior, has been born in the town of David, and he's the Lord. That's what they knew, and so that's what they told. And that's enough, church. That's enough. That that Jesus has been born. He has come to save. And when he saves you, he is your Lord and he becomes the ruler and king of your life. That's enough. So that's what they did. 18 and 19, they proclaimed. Their proclamation caused wonder and great honor. You notice the results of those who heard it? <clears throat> they were in awe. Like, holy cow, I can't believe it. Of course you can't. It's a miracle. And then Mary began to ponder and treasure up. See, some people are going to hear what we have to say that's going to cause them to wonder and be in awe. Some people are longing for what we have. And when they hear it, they're going to ponder because God has already primed them. Some people will reject what we have to say, but there are people out there who will be in awe of what we have to communicate. And some that in God's already stirring their hearts and what they need in their dry souls is the fresh water of the gospel to bring life again. Yeah. So I'm just here to encourage you today. Yeah, you're going to get rejected. Jesus was. Who do we think we are to think we're not? Yeah. But I am here to tell you that in the midst of your rejection, you're going to have people who are in awe and are captivated and marveled by God, and they're going to be wooed into his presence. And some who are dire and desperate for it and are longing. They're going to be grateful and thankful because in their dry souls, they've been crying out to God, and you giving the gospel is the answer to that prayer. But we be a people who proclaim. And we've just seen too much here at Zeal. Like, we've seen people, literally, one's in the room, I'm not going to call her out because I do it often, but we've seen people, God has had them on the streets, drawn them in here, and they're like, something dragged me here. I'm like, yeah, it did. And there's Holy Spirit. Welcome. <laughs> and as they draw them here, they're like, my soul has been longing for something. And we just, we say things from the Bible. And on those two Sundays, I can think of in particular people who came here and who got saved. I'm like, this is going to be an awkward message for unbelievers. Because I'm talking about some hard stuff. <laughs> stuff that's like for Christian folks. And boom, God saves people. And so I'm just here to say, man, like, God is priming people and prepping people. Mary is one of those people. She was caught up. She knew what she was caught up in. And as she saw it, it caused a pondering in her heart. It caused a smile to overwhelm her face and a peace to reside in her soul. Because the fulfillment of what the angel had promised was coming to fruition. It would be people that proclaim. Verse 20. They returned. They returned. They had an encounter with God that changed their lives. You cannot make an argument otherwise. And they went and did directly what they were told, but then they went and returned to what? Shepherding. I'm just here to tell you, if you have an encounter with God, oftentimes it doesn't mean you need to go start a ministry. It doesn't mean you need to quit your job and become a pastor. It doesn't mean you necessarily need to move across the world, sell everything, and you have to go. And here's the thing. If God's calling you to do that, don't let anybody stop you. However, God had them caught up in something miraculous that no one else was caught up in, and what did they do? They returned. Same job, different men. Yeah. Same job, different men. You know, you know what the world needs? You to go back to your same job as a different person. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. I was dead, I'm now alive. I was riddled with anxiety and fear and depression and addiction, mm -hmm. and now I'm free and alive, and I just want to run through the halls. Mm -hmm. I just want to scream Jesus at the top of my lungs and make you uncomfortable. That's what I want to do. Same job, different person. I guarantee you the shepherds never shepherded the same again, but yet they shepherded. Same job, different people. And the Christmas story should do that to you and me. It should cause us to go back into the same ordinary areas and, and pathways of life, but as, as different individual people. That's how the gospel gets out. That's how the mission of the church gets done. That's how the world gets flipped upside down, is people go back to the same job, as different people. And after having an encounter with God, he might call you to return, to return to a normal flow of life, but he will never call you to be the same person you were. Ever. So, so don't mishear me in saying go back to the normal way of living as in back to your old ways, back to your sinful patterns, back to lower things. 
Francis Schaeffer says this as he's pondering about what it would have been like for the shepherds to return. He says, can we imagine one of the shepherds remarking that it's very nice that we'd seen an angel, and it's nice that we've seen Christ, the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for for so long. And it's nice that I believe in him unlike some of the other people in Bethlehem. And that, it's going to, that I'm going to be in heaven one day. But in reality, in practice, it's not going to make a difference at all in my life. Francis Schaeffer says, this is inconceivable. <clears throat> in other words, for, for the shepherds to have an encounter with the living God and just be able to be like, all right, well, that was cool. Let me go back to the ways it was. Make an argument that's inconceivable. Why? Because the glory of God is too overwhelming. If you've really encountered the living God, you cannot, cannot, cannot be the same. So when God's coming close to us, when he calls us to proclaim, when he comes near, it changes us forever. But the question becomes, okay, how? How does it change me forever? Let me, let me tell you. I'm glad you asked. Repentance becomes our reality. We become people who habitually repent. It just gets contagious, too. And when I say repent, I'm not just saying, oh, I'm sorry for some sins I did. You actually change the way you live. You confess, which is a part of it, and then you actually turn and walk the other way. Repentance becomes a reality when we've encountered the presence of God. Prayer and communion with God become our comfort zones. <clears throat> and I, testimony in my whole life, I used to hate being alone with God. I didn't like what I heard. I didn't like who I was. And then and God changed me, made me aware of my identity, and like going to God is not my default in my comfort zone. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it or I always do it. I'm just telling you, like, man, if I'm feeling anxious or freaked out, my first place to go is communion with God. Pray. It becomes our comfort zone when we encounter the presence of God. Courage and boldness bubble up in our souls and it spills out of our mouths and our hands and our feet. You, you, you encounter the, like, these shepherds encounter the living God. Game changer. Courage for days. They're just going to go and do, because they remember, man, my God showed up and showed off. So it's about how crazy I look or how crazy I sound or how wild and how many heads they think I have. Like, I have courage because of who I am and whose I am and what I've seen. See, proclaiming the goodness of God and the good news of his salvation through his son Jesus becomes the only mission that matters in life. What does God want for me? What does God want in my life? That's it right there, to proclaim the good news of Jesus. How do you do that? You have a lot of freedom and liberty. You do but that's got to be this whole mission. It doesn't matter what, what job you have, what kind of family dynamic you have, what house you live in. If the mission isn't about making much of Jesus. Another thing that happens when you encounter the presence of God, materialism is murder. You care less about your stuff and more about the kingdom. Self-centeredness begins to cease. You think less about you. Those shepherds didn't walk away from that encounter and be like, I'm so awesome. And I'm just the best shepherd there ever was because the angels came to me and not those jokers. No, they walked away saying, my goodness, God is amazing and awesome and wonderful. What did we just get caught up in? And if they're having an argument about which one was better, who cares? They're focused on God. Anxiety, fear, and doubt get put to death. Petty problems and issues that once bogged you down begin to fade into the past. When you encounter the presence of God, then you just get less petty. You stop caring about the stuff that, that bugs you and bothers you because you got caught up in bigger things. God's glory becomes overwhelming to the point that it gives way to glorification and praise of our great king. Notice what they did. They returned to doing what? Glorifying and praising. They weren't returning hoping. They weren't even returning and relishing in the past. They, they were returning with the present reality that God is good, he is real, he is worthy of glory, honor, and praise. So they weren't dwelling on what had happened. They were caught up in what was happening and who they were happening with. They got caught up in the reality that God was there. He was with them. And if he could speak to them then, he could speak to them now. If they could be heard by them then, then he could be heard by them now. So Christmas reminds us of the reality that God has come close to proclaim the good news to us so that we could proclaim good news to the whole world. So the story of Christmas is one that's not just for December 23rd, 4th, and 5th. It's year-round, 365. So let us be a people who proclaim with our lips and our lives that Jesus came close to us, and he's coming close to us today so that we could come close to him. God comes close to humanity in humility to provide us a peace between us and God and then us and one another so that we can be people who proclaim.
I want to close this morning by proclaiming his goodness to you. So I want to give you a moment to kind of prepare your hearts. Whether you want to close your eyes and bow your head, if you want to stand up, kneel down, you have freedom in here. Just don't be a distraction and a nuisance to other people. But I want to read some things over you to remind you of his goodness. I didn't make these up, by the way. I like ripped them from a song, but they're good. So. Here we go. Humble as a lamb, but as strong as a lion. He is God in the highest, and there is nothing higher. He can walk on water. He can talk in fire. He's the hope of the nations. He's the eternal provider. He's known for feeding the thousands, for mending the broken, for healing the sick, for making nothing into something. He's the hope for the hopeless, and he brings life-changing moments. He's the ancient of days, lamb that was slain, breaker of chains. He's the beginning and end. He's the savior of men. He's the killer of death. He's the way, truth, life. He's God most high. And all creation bows its knee to the holy king of kings. He's the God of heaven and beneath. Let me tell you about him. Jesus is his name. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the resurrected Savior. He's the author of life, the universe maker. He's the almighty creator, the OG planet shaker. He's who was, he is, and there will be, and he will be there forever. He accepted his death, but he was not defeated. He took hold of the keys and then he unlocked the kingdom. And he switched them for freedom. Even death could not beat him. And now he's living and breathing and nothing can defeat him. And now he's alive and he's living in me. He's living in you too. And he changed my life now and I'm living and free. He's the king and that is what I believe. He is the Lord and he's reigning supreme. He's the ancient of days. Lamb that was slain, breaker of chains. He's the beginning and end, savior of men, killer of death. He's the way, truth, life. He's God most high. All creation bows its knee to the holy king of kings. He's God of heaven and beneath. Let me tell you about him. Jesus is his name.